I am Ahmed Ragab. I'm the Richard T. Watson Associate Professor of Science and Religion here at the Divinity School, and I will be the moderator for this panel. It's really my pleasure to be here. Many thanks to Frank and to all the uh, staff at the Center for the Study of World Religions for putting together this conference. Uh, I will say very few words about our speakers. You all have already biographical information about them. I'll just say very few words and step away so that I would allow them uh, to share their remarks with us. Uh, I will introduce them in the order that they will speak, um, and then they will speak uh, after that. Uh, I will start with my um, colleague and friend, Dan McCannon. Professor McCannon is the Rolf Waldo Emerson Unitarian Universalist Association Senior Lecturer in Divinity. He received his PhD from the University of Chicago and joined HDS uh, in this position in 2008. His first book, Identifying the Image of God, Radical Christians and Nonviolent Power in the Antipelum United States, uh, came out in 2002. And his uh, other publications include Touching the World, Christian Communities Transforming Society in 2007, and The Catholic Worker After Dorothy in 2008, and the Prophetic Encounters, Religion, and the American Radical Tradition in 2011. And this book won the Frederick G. Mettler Book Award. Uh, Professor McCannon is currently completing two book projects, a study of environmental initiatives inspired by Rudolf Steiner, and an edited anthology of primary sources for Unitarian Universalist history. Our second speaker is Professor Whitney Sanford, uh, Professor Whitney Sanford received her PhD in Religious Studies from University of Pennsylvania, specializing in North Indian devotion traditions. She teaches and researches in two main areas, religion and nature and religions in, of Asia. Her current book project being the change what Gandhi can teach us about sustainability, self-sufficiency, and nonviolence explores Gandhi's influence on contemporary interna uh, international communities in the United States. Her recent publication uh, include Growing Stories from India, Religion and the Fate of Agriculture from University of Kentucky in 2012, and Singing Krishna from uh, Sunni Press in 2008. Our last speaker is, is uh, Professor Norman Wersba. He is the Professor of Theology, Ecology, and Agrarian Studies and the Senior Fellow of the Keenan Institute of, for Ethics at uh, Duke Divinity School. Uh, Professor Wurzba pursues research at the intersection of theology, philosophy, ecology, and agrarian and environmental studies. His current research is centered on uh, a recovery of the doctrine of creation and the restatement of humanity in terms of its creaturely life. Professor Wurzba has published The Paradise of God, Renewing Religion in an Ecological Age, and Living the Sabbath, Discovering the Rhythms uh, of Rest and Delight. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. Thank you so much, Ahmed, and thanks uh, to all of you for uh, devoting such a large chunk of time uh, to this important and renewing uh, uh, conversation. I'd like to join all of my colleagues um, from Harvard who've already welcomed you uh, to our space and to our ongoing conversation. And I'd particularly like to thank Mary Evelyn and John uh, for uh, sticking with us, uh, coming back and sharing so many of the fruits of, of what you have uh, nurtured in your garden, uh, your scholarly garden over the past 20 years. Uh, uh, as you know, if you had a chance to look at my pre-distributed paper, I opened that paper with a plea for more attention to agriculture uh, within the broader environmental movement uh, and within, uh, within our work as scholars of religion and ecology. Uh, for those of us who teach in uh, major metropolitan areas like this one, part of this is a function of the strange way in which uh, we in the United States have organized space. Uh, it is much easier uh, to get up from this room and walk uh, until you find a quasi-wilderness space uh, that has been set aside for recreational uh, use. Uh, you can take a long, lovely walk at uh, Middlesex Fells uh, uh, or the Blue Hills. Um, other metropolitan areas have similar spaces where you can think of your primary role as a human being connected to nature as an observer, watching uh, seasons turn, watching leaves fall, all this kind of great stuff. It is much harder 
to stand up um, from this space and walk to a real farm, uh, walk to a livestock operation, walk uh, to a farm that is producing uh, enough food of whatever sort uh, to sell on the market. Uh, that's changing uh, with the rise of urban agriculture. You can certainly find some chickens uh, in a very short walk from here. Uh, but it's nevertheless the case uh, that those of us who inhabit spaces like this can find it very difficult to extend our imagination to the spaces inhabited by farmers uh, uh, who are every day figuring out how uh, uh, to live uh, humans and other um, life forms in creative symbiosis. Uh, and as you know, agricultural communities in the United States and around the world are suffering deeply today uh, because of capitalist economic systems that assume that everything can be exchanged for everything else. Uh, and if everything can be exchanged for everything else, uh, the fact that you can't eat money uh, is easily uh, forgotten. Uh, 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 and so capitalism perpetually casts farmers off their land uh, uh, or into despair. Uh, uh, and so I would uh, encourage um, uh, all of you, uh, as you teach courses uh, in religion and ecology, uh, uh, to find out where the farmers are uh, uh, in your neighborhood, um, in your region, uh, and find ways to invite your students into conversation uh, with those farmers. Uh, as many of you know, we had a conference here uh, last spring on um, spirituality and sustainable agriculture in which you know, at least 50% of our 200 participants were active farmers. Uh, and, uh, and they really relished the opportunity to be in dialogue with, uh, with the scholars of religion. Uh, um, I'd also just uh, suggest that farms are anthropocosmic spaces, um, spaces that break down uh, the sort of deep ecology, shallow ecology dichotomy uh, as different earth creatures uh, find ways uh, to live together that are mutually fruitful. Uh, as I was uh, reading um, your other contributions and the presentations so far, it occurred to me that I might also want to make a plea for the discipline of history. Uh, I, I think I'm fairly unusual here as someone who's done uh, most of my work in historical contexts. And, and so I was constantly reminded of the different time frame in which I think uh, uh, from some others. It's, of course, appropriate uh, that many of our presentations here have focused on the 20-year time frame uh, since uh, the inaugural conferences uh, and also really the 20 years in which through the, the guidance of John and Mary Evelyn, this academic field has flourished. Uh, uh, we also often speak in the 40, 50 year time frame of since Lynn White or since Rachel Carson. Uh, uh, when we speak in those time frames, uh, we can feed into an assumption that religion and ecology is a religious response to an environmental movement that originally was something other than religion. Uh, uh, um, but this obscures the specific religious and spiritual currents that were there at the birth of environmentalism and of the many different strands of environmentalism. I think about this kind of in, with an analogy to my earlier work on the history of religion and socialism. Uh, when the social gospel movement emerged in the early 20th century, many of its leaders saw themselves as the religious response to a socialist movement that was itself other than religion. But in fact, they were important religious traditions uh, that had fed into the birth of socialism, and some of them were quite different from the kinds of religiosity carried by the social gospel movement. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of the early utopian socialist Charles Fourier, uh, whose worldview was a kind of esoteric Trinitarianism that was seeking to uncode the deep co uh, codes embedded uh, in the structure of nature. Uh, um, it was, in, in a sense, 
another anthropocosmic uh, uh, spiritual tradition that um, is not unrelated to the spiritualities underlying the emergence of organic agriculture. Uh, uh, if we take a long historical look at the religious and spiritual roots of environmentalism, we'll see ideas and practices that are not well represented in the field of religion and ecology today, some of them repellent, uh, uh, some of them deeply uh, capable of widening and renewing our vision. So what do we see if we look at the roughly 100-year history of one important strand of environmentalism, the organic agriculture movement? Uh, uh, and by organic agriculture, I mean the social movement of farmers who, with access to chemical uh, fertilizers and pesticides, choose not to use those. Obviously, there's another history of organic agriculture that's thousands of years long. Uh, uh, so when we look at the organized organic movement and its spiritual roots, the first thing that we see most clearly is Rudolf Steiner's anthroposophy uh, and specifically the biodynamic approach uh, to agriculture that he initiated in the 1920s. Uh, um, people who were inspired by Rudolf Steiner were the first group of farmers who organized around the organic ideal they were the first farmers to develop a system of certification, of labeling um, food as organically produced. Uh, they were the first uh, uh, farmers to mobilize against uh, the use of pesticides, spraying of DDT. Uh, uh, and um, they were the farmers who created the idea of community-supported agriculture, of, of um, uh, consumers and farmers partnering together uh, to finance farms. Uh, uh, these farmers had a set of spiritual ideas uh, that challenge uh, the assumption that otherworldliness other is antithetical to environmental concern. Steiner wrote books with titles like How to Know Higher Worlds and talked about human beings as having evolved on multiple planets prior to this one. Uh, my first introduction to religion and ecology was Sally McFake's class at uh, Vanderbilt Divinity School, she taught us very clearly that a good way uh, to care about this world is to see it as the only one. I still mostly feel that way, um, and so my interest uh, in biodynamics uh, stemmed from the challenge of realizing that people who were doing much more to care for the earth had a spirituality very different uh, from my own. Another thing carried uh, by this tradition is an alternative scientific paradigm. Um, often referred to as Goetheanism uh, because of Steiner's uh, indebtedness to the scientific work of the German poet Goethe, uh, which emphasizes close observation uh, and subjectivity rather than experimental distancing between observer and observed. Uh, another important uh, piece of this tradition uh, is a willingness to make connections. Uh, uh, Steiner had ideas about cooperative economics uh, that are, are represented in community-supported agriculture. He had ideas about care for people with disabilities uh, um, that lead most uh, biodynamic farms to find ways of incorporating people of diverse abilities uh, into the work of the farm. He had ideas about uh, the renewal of Christian liturgy uh, that leads many biodynamic farmers uh, to a role as priests uh, in the Steiner-inspired uh, religious communion known as the, um, the Christian community, confusing name. Uh, and that means that there is a hundred-year heritage of thought about how to renew uh, liturgy and connect it to farming that I think can be of value uh, to the much wider uh, array of Christians today who are asking those same kinds of questions. Uh, we see a lot of other things uh, in the history of organics besides anthroposophy. I've run out of time, uh, so I would just uh, flag um, Guinonian traditionalism. Uh, Lord Northbourne, the person who coined the term organic agriculture, uh, subsequently became a disciple of René Guinon and an initiate uh, in a Sufi order. Uh, I, um, I would highlight... Uh, High church agrarianism, uh, many other uh, founders of 
uh, the organics movement uh, were kind of uh, Tory, uh, revive rural Britain uh, type people. Um, this bled into uh, forms of eco-fascism, uh, so there's a lot of complexity to sort out there. And then finally, I would name a tradition I learned about from one of my students last year, uh, the tradition of Joe Ray. Uh, this is a tradition, uh, a Japanese new religious movement with a strong emphasis on uh, spiritual healing uh, that also makes the practice of nature farming. This is farming not only without uh, chemical uh, fertilizers, but without any outside farm fertilizers whatsoever. Uh, an integral part of their uh, tradition, and as I note in my paper, uh, the main way you can get organic chicken in Brazil today uh, is through the work of people inspired by, these, by this Japanese uh, new movement. So I would just close uh, with a call for ideological pluralism uh, in the work of, of religion and ecology. Some of our traditions will be deeply aligned with the modern scientific worldview uh, and work closely with the kind of science that happens in university departments. Some of the traditions that are feeding into this uh, uh, have very different ways of thinking about science. Just as in sustainable agriculture, we don't tolerate monocultures. Uh, we assume that very different species have a lot to offer one another. So I hope as we continue to develop this field, uh, we will resist uh, uh, ideological and spiritual monocultures and seek wisdom in the many places where it can be found. Thank you. So I didn't get the memo about we weren't using any pictures or slides, so, you, so I'm going to invite you at times to uh, use your ecological imagination to try to visualize what's like embedded on this. And you can also look at my blog, Florida Waterscapes, to see some of these pictures if you want. Um, so a couple weeks ago during a class presentation, one of my students commented that she said, I thought people who use the earth don't really care about it, meaning people like farmers and <laughs> fishers. And this student, as part of a, a class project, she'd gone to the Georgia Boys Fish Camp, and the project is about riverine ways of life along the St. John's River. And when she spoke with people at this fish camp, she discovered that they cared deeply about the river and for preserving their ways of life along the river. And so this fall, both of my classes are conducting historical and ethnographic research on the St. John's River. And their work and mine will be featured in both a physical and a digital exhibit um, on the St. John's River. And the exhibit's called River of Dreams, the St. John's River and its Springs. And it will be held in the Matheson History Museum in Gainesville, Florida this winter. The students' comment and the project's central questions reflect some of the main themes that have run through my, my own work, which is basically, how do we derive our sustenance from the earth in ways that reflect care and responsibility for the entire biotic community? So human survival, which we know from farming, requires using the earth, growing food, for example, but we've got to figure out how to do this without destroying our ecosystem. And that's one of the things I talked about in my book, Growing Stories. Now, thinking about issues of farming and ranching and fishing, these are really important issues for my home state of Florida. I teach at the University of Florida. I live in Gainesville. We're central Florida. And probably, as most of you know, Florida is right now an environmental disaster. We've got all kinds of crap going on. Our, our Lord Voldemort has said we are not allowed to use the word climate change. Um, and at the same time, we have 75% of our population voted for Amendment 1, which actually send, which sends money to buy lands for conservation. So we've got a really divided constituency of how much people care about the, the environment there. And so where, what I want to speak about during most of this talk is um, we need to move past the choir, and when we talked yesterday about breaking down silos, I'm interested in breaking down some of the silos, or at least starting to speak to people outside of the academy, and some of the, a lot of these people who are very conflicted about the environment, um, who might, for example, love their place, love the rivers, they love to fish, yet at the same time they're voting in politicians who are denying climate change, for example, and bringing in a lot of polluting ways. So I'm basically, with my students, I'm using the St. John's River as a way to think about that. I got interested in the St. John's River and the people who depend on it when I was doing work for my book on intentional communities, um, which is it's not being the change anymore. It's called Living Sustainably, and it will be out 
this May, which I'm excited about. And in this, while I was doing the research for this book, I saw people come together over food and seed in really interesting ways. So if you think about issues of saving seed, you see people coming together on this, on this issue from very different political and religious backgrounds. They found ways to have common, um, common dialogue. And so I, that's, um, this idea of common dialogue is something I think we need to be focusing on more and looking at how people from very different backgrounds come, come together over these issues. So in Florida, over a number of years, I visited a number of fish camps, like George Boy's fish camps and Middleton Fish Camp, which is near the headwaters of the St. John's, and their main sign says, Nature Held in Trust. These are people who care deeply about the river, but they also are very uneasy with the broader environmental movement, and probably be fairly uneasy with some of the discussions we're having, we're having here. At the same time, I participated in a number of rallies to save our springs, to save the St. John's, where you see a lot of different types of people come. You see your normal Sierra Club types, but you also see a lot of people who would resent being ever labeled with the term environmentalist. Um, and in Florida, we care deeply about our springs. These are, these are a treasure of ours, and there's a collective, regardless of your political affiliation, there's a collective mourning against uh, about the fact that these are, are basically being so, so degraded. I mean, I think almost everybody feels a real sense of sadness over this. So a number of the participants at these rallies I've attended, they're fighting for their homes, their livelihoods, and family members. And I became interested in seeing you know, how these people from their very different backgrounds express their concerns. Um, and now, if you can imagine a map right here, the St. John's River, which in 98 was named one of the um, America's Heritage Rivers, it flows northward for 310 miles from its headwaters, which is down in South Florida near Vera Beach. And it basically starts in a very marshy headwaters area, a lot like the, the ecosystem is a lot like the Everglades. It's really slow, slow flow, um, something Marjorie Kanan Rawlings wrote about in Hyacinth Drift. It goes through a series of lakes and finally spills out into the Atlantic Ocean just a bit north of Jacksonville. Gainesville, which is where I live, lies within the Ocklawaha River Basin, which is one of the 10 ma major watersheds of this river. And continuous settlements of people from Native Americans to contemporary fish camps basically remind us that this river was once the hub of economic activity and a major form of transportation. And people, and it was once our highway, basically. So people have lived within its ebbs and flows for thousands and thousands of years. And, this, and the relationship with this river is one of the ways that's it defines how people have called North Central Florida home. Many of the people today who work and live along the St. John's River descend from the Florida crackers who came to Florida as, as pioneers, long before roads and air conditioning made it possible for the rest of us to live there. Um, and for this population, Florida is home. And many of these people have multi-generational histories of making a living from this river, from fishing, small-scale ecotourism, small-scale farming. Today, crabbing and shrimping provide income for the city of Palacta, which is about 45 minutes from me. But these things might these industries will probably disappear by overfishing in the same way once the thriving eel fisheries industry and the American shad fisheries disappeared. Um, I see, for example, with the shrimping, and I had a nice picture of some shrimpers casting their net with the sun on the net, and in the background are some of the first squall lines of um, Hurricane Matthew, which visited us last week. Um, as sea level rise brings higher saltwater concentrations, the shrimp are going to migrate south towards the fresh water that they need and away from Palatka. So that, that industry will probably disappear. Nonetheless, attitudes towards preserving the fisheries and thinking about how do you put controls. This, I live in an anti-regulation state. One of the uh, other slides I had was a sign right near one of the fish camps which basically talked about the Florida Wildlife Commission as a bunch of communists, in other words, um, all of which were spelled wrong. But <laughs> it's a very telling sign of, what, of this tension that people who love this area want it to be preserved, want their industries, but hate regulation and hate the government. Um, and so it's, a, it's, it's an interesting political place to live. So these attitudes are, are complex and complicated. Um, but even though a number of them derive their income, through these river-based businesses, and I call them old Florida environmentalists, they often, they, they, they care about it, but they often um, deny climate change, and they would do express their care for the river using terms like, say, creation care. They're not gonna say they're environmentalists. And it, it's, it's multiple populations along this river. For example, you see a lot of African Americans fishing, fishing for subsistence, and some of these patterns of subsistence derive from long-term relationships with the land since the, the pre-Civil War days. Um, today, newer immigrants, Central Americans, for example, um, 
Southeast Asians, they're creating ties to the river through, through subsistence and commercial fishing as well. And almost all of these folks along the river, they recognize changes in fish populations. They recognize the new flow and, and water levels along this area. And some of the problems, particularly on the Ocklawaha River, um, which is a tributary of the St. John's, this was flooded for the t entirely ill-fated cross Florida barge canal. It has robbed people of the banks. The river became flooded, and so now only, really only people who have boats are able to fish and derive subsistence for this river. So it's having some, some real economic um, effects as well. So how do we broaden our conversation language to include the numerous groups who love this river in, in their home? So a couple days before Hurricane Matthew, I chartered a, a friend, I chartered a friend's boat for a photo shoot of the St. John's near Palatka. I invited Sam Carr and Dean Campbell, who, both of whom are architects of the Putnam County uh, Bartram Trail, and they're great enthusiasts of the Quaker, bar, um, Quaker botanist William Bartram. And last for, uh, fall, all of us had been on a four-day kayaking trip that was based upon the Bartram sites in this area and, and was highlighting some of the, the ecotourism in the area. We took a chance with the weather because we could basically see the uh, squall lines from Matthew coming in, but we'd already organized the shoot. Um, as we're going along, we could already see where the water had come up, partly because of the coming storm, uh, because of Matthew, but also because of sea level rise, where people's docks and lawns are already disappearing. Um, several years prior to this, Sam and Dean and others had, become de had started developing the Bartram Trail in Putnam County. And so this is a series of paddling, biking, and walking trails that highlight places that William Bartram describes in his travel. Both of these, Sam and Dean, admire Bartram's blending of spirituality and nature and, res and Bartram's respect for the native peoples of Florida. So Sam Carr calls Bartram the original hippie. But more important, they see the trail as a means of bringing historical memory and appreciation of the St. John's River to contemporary residents. So while one trail, the trail is just, it's simply a form of ecotourism. It's a great way to get out hiking and biking and, and paddling. It's also giving local residents um, and people in this area a series of talking points and pathways to thinking about river restoration and sea level rise. And further, Bartram's religiously inflected descriptions of the St. John's and the Springs verbalize what a lot of people think. The river is my church. And, and at fish camps, I've heard a number of people speaking, okay, speaking about the river in very clearly religious religiously inflected language. And so while this is no panacea, appeals to home and memory offer some opportunities to, to develop a place-based environmental ethic. And I'm, I'm, I have two minutes, so I'm going to run through the rest of this sort of quickly. Um, Florida, there's a number of people in Florida with deep roots, but a lot more of us have very shallow roots in Florida. And I think Whitney Bauman wants to make a comment about academics as nomads. And so I'm also working with a group of pedagogists in the southeast to think about how do we give students our toolkits to know, make these places their homes and help students become native to their place. And one really nice example of that in Florida, a local author for us is Marjorie Kennett Rawlings, who wrote The Yearling in Cross Creek, who came down from the Northeast, fell in love with the cracker lifestyle, and fell in love with the, our scrub landscape, which is really tough, but incredibly, incredibly beautiful. And she developed a citrus, she had a citrus farm. Her husband le left, hated it. She stayed there, and she transformed from a person who really saw the land only in terms of use to someone who thought it was extremely valuable to, to preserve, use it as a farmer, but also to not, not clear cut. She became a very outspoken, um, outspoken advocate of this. And so a friend of mine, an archivist at University of Florida, has written an article where she talks about Marjorie Kanan Rawlings' transformation from outsider to, to, seeing, the land as, to seeing the land as enchanted. Um, so Rawlings became native to her place, which is a phrase I'm shamelessly borrowing from West Jackson. Um, but to me, learning to know and live within the limits of our watersheds, food sheds, and woodsheds seems to me the only way forward for a couple of reasons. First, focusing on our own food sheds and watersheds helps bring these big environmental problems we have to a manageable scale. We can think within our ecosystem. It's really hard to think climate change. We can talk about, talk and act within a local area, even if that simply means creating reg better regulations for fishing or, or fishing more sustainably or even buying local produce. But I, I think even more, more important, acting locally in our own backyards offers opportunities to build bridges from people between vastly different political and socioeconomic backgrounds. 
So for example, Saving Our Springs has brought people together in this, this, common, um, in this common effort. And as I've been talking to people at these rallies and going down along the St. John's River, I've heard uh, just amazing stories about um, people who I, I know from some of the labels that they're wearing are very different than I am on a political spectrum. Um, but care so deeply about this river and are telling these heartrending. you know, on the one hand, they're talking about their, their great appeal for the gun rallies in Ocala. They're also telling me about their sadness and they're coming to the river for solace. One man talked about how after his wife had died, he comes there every day and eats lunch. And so there's, these are, these are people we need to, these are the silos I'm talking about. We need to talk to these folks and figure out how to do it. And I'm in Florida, so, you know, when I think maybe when you're in the Northeast it's different, but these, these outside of Gainesville, my little bubble, these are my, these are the people at the boat ramps and, and on the water. And so I'm trying to figure out how to have dialogue um, with that. And so one of the points of doing this, I'm stopping right now. One of the points of our <laughs> exhibit is to engage with the public humanities, digital humanities, have, um, have community conversations. And I'm hoping that with this museum that will help. And again, that's not a, a magic bullet, um, no easy answers, but I think it's one way at least I can act and I see forward for us. Um, so anyway, thank you. Thank you. So I am here because of the generosity and hospitality of others, and I would list first and foremost the uncommon kindness of Mary Evelyn and John. You have created this warmth that I am now enjoying, and I am so grateful. Hospitality is an important theme when talking about food and agriculture. Eating is the act of the most profound intimacy. It's more intimate than sex, maybe not more intimate than maternity. But you have to think about this, that every time you eat, you consume the life and death of another. You take them into your body. What could be more intimate than that? And yet, at precisely this time, we have become the most ignorant eaters the world has ever known. We have no idea where food comes from. We have no idea, for the most part, under what conditions the food was being produced because ours is an, an anonymous food economy. It's the economy of the one night stand, as the other Barry called it, where we come mostly in the dark, enjoy what we want to enjoy, pay our money, and don't ask any questions. There's a lot that's gone into this kind of anonymity Surely urbanization in its very particular modern forms has had a lot to do with this. We're living a grand experiment, folks, where for the first time in the history of the world, we have more people living in cities who have no connection to food other than as the shoppers of it. And the question is, what is this going to do to our humanity right? when we no longer understand through this most intimate action of eating how our bodies the flesh of who we are joins with the flesh of the world. And so I think one of the things that's so important about the work we do in religion and ecology is that we're trying to, we're trying to construct and imagine a world in which the flesh of the world can be whole. And we're having so much difficulty about this, I think, because we have, whether in a choosing way or not, we have entered this industrial neoliberal world in which separation and division and conquest are the guiding motifs. And it's reflected in our food system in particular when we desire to have food as cheaply and conveniently as possible. And this, of course, is destroying the world. But it's not just destroying the world. We know that this industrial diet that is now being exported around the world is perhaps the most unhealthy, uniformly unhealthy diet the world has ever seen. And so the damage that we're inflicting to our soils and waters and plant and animal life, we're also inflicting upon ourselves. And so my question is, how are we as religion and nature scholars, religion and ecology scholars, going to have anything to do with this? Because my central conviction is that this is not something that we're going to be able to address simply by looking at food in a new way. Right? 
Looking is not primarily the issue here. We have to find forms of work that will draw people back into food production. And I don't mean by this something like everybody becoming a farmer. That's unrealistic and most of us are not smart enough to do it. <laughs> what I'm advocating is for us to look to our traditions to see how these traditions give us profound insight into our embodied drawing of life from the life and death of others. Right? When we realize that for us to live, others have to die, we enter into the most profound human questions. Questions that our foodie culture does not know how to address. And so as we turn to our traditions, which have tremendous, valuable insight into how we live in this world that can be described in so many ways as a kind of altar, a place of gift, a place of the reception of blessing, a place of hospitality, right? Once we can figure out how our traditions can become the sources of inspiration for these new modes of agricultural work, and the work is crucial because we're not going to discover something like the sacred dimension of food simply by talking about food in different ways, right? If we think about the language, I forget now who used the language of presence. Maybe it was you, it's beautiful language. I mean, if you grow your own food and you, you sense the presence of a tomato, have you grown tomatoes? Have you tasted the bruschetta of your tomatoes? If this is not an experience of presence, I don't know what is. It's a fruit ex it's food explosion in your head. Right? It's simply magnificent. So as we turn to our religious traditions, and I'm happy to report that this book has just come out. <laughs> Whitney and Frederick have essays in it on religion and sustainable agriculture. Right? Food has become an issue for religion scholars. Agriculture has not yet. And so just as our culture is in a foodie turn, we now need an agricultural turn in our study so that we can see how through the embodied activities, the flesh of our bodies joining the flesh of the world, we might have a chance to rediscover something about our dependence, but something also about the blessing of our life together. And I think also that this will have the effect of economizing our study. Right? And what I mean by economizing, I mean taking us out of the world of texts and language only. So much of the scholarship that we do, I think, is a verbal kind of scholarship, or it's a site-based kind of scholarship. It's not the scholarship that happens through the tactile sense of touch and taste, which are the fundamental senses, right? Aristotle, as much as he's given us hierarchies, he at least understood that touch is absolutely fundamental, and we don't know what to do with touch as the form of knowing, even though in the very word homo sapiens, we have sapere, which means to taste. Can we taste the world in a new way as scholars? Can we help the people that we work with, that we write for, that we become activists for, to learn to discover the taste of the world in a new sort of way? This is going to be a fundamental question, and I believe that it's particularly faith communities, religious communities around the world, who stand the best chance of stopping the juggernaut of industrial food production. And we're seeing it already, right? Many faith communities, they own land. And they often own land in places where there are food deserts, in places where the land is extremely expensive. Why could they not turn this land into demonstration sites Right? where the feeding of the world can happen, and also where the sense of the world's sacred, hospitable character can be tasted. That would be my hope. We have time for a few questions. Of consuming other living beings. It may be a blessing to have an organic chicken in Brazil. 
Brazil for the people who eat the organic chicken. I'm not sure it's a blessing for the chicken. <laughs> now, it may be that the environmental movement is really too young to seriously be raising the issue of animal rights, just like in 1969, the advent of the second wave of feminism, nobody at that point was talking about gay marriage. But I would just like some kind of recognition, if it's possible, that there is a moral issue with the consumption of animals, not only industrial animals, but any of them. I would like to see a conversation about the moral considerations of eating plants. I, um, I understand vegetarian arguments, and I understand the value of them, but I also sense within some of the vegetarian arguments a kind of Gnosticism, a desire to be disentangled from the processes of life and death. And it's especially, I think, a problem within the kind of industrial food system that we have. And I know that we're not going to solve this question here in a couple of minutes, but uh, I didn't bring up the issue of, of animal rights uh, in this particular talk, because first of all, it's 10 minutes. But then secondly, it's an enormously complex question, because when you think about eating as an act that entangles us into the life and death of others, I think it is simply naive to draw some line around animals and say, once we hit animals, everything changes. We're talking about how plant life depends upon massive life and death cycles that are going on in the soil. We've barely begun to understand the forms of life that are going on beneath the ground. And so the people who want to simply say, you can't eat meat, uh, the, the salad bar is not morally neutral. <laughs> I, I would echo everything that that Norman just said, um, but also thank you for raising the issue because th this is a work in progress. Uh, um, the spiritual tradition that um, inspires those, that chicken producer in Brazil does not actually encourage the consumption of chicken. Uh, so, um, uh, so they are struggling with that, with that inherent tension. Um, the spiritual tradition that I mostly uh, study, anthroposophy, uh, has... Um, has really been at the forefront of, of thinking about how, about what the most ethical way of producing dairy products is. Uh, um, uh, the way you can tell a biodynamic farm is that all the cows have horns, uh, which is partly a spiritual principle that horns uh, channel cosmic influences in their teaching, but also a way of honoring the full bodily integrity of the cows. Once you take that step, that dairy farmers ought to be honoring the full bodily integrity of the cows, and cabbage farmers ought to be honoring the full life cycle of the cabbage. Uh, further questions arise, uh, and many biodynamic farmers are wondering if they can continue to, do, to produce meat and dairy, even in the highly idealistic ways that they're doing. Um, this is, this is an important conversation, but it has to happen from the standpoint of our symbiotic relationship with other creatures not from uh, the idea that we can jump instantly into a place of purity. I just want to say one quick thing. You know, the Humane Society of the U.S. has worked on these issues for a long time, John Hoyt, but the present president, Wayne Pacelli, has involved the religious communities on humane treatment of animals, but also of the people working in factories, the justice issues, and so on. So some work, more work needs to be done, but the Humane Society and others are working with religious communities on this. Hi, thank you so much. So I have a question particularly for the whole panel, but for uh, Professor Witzba. I am really interested and intrigued with this idea of inviting people to be part of food production more intimately. Um, but I also think deeply about the ways that specifically two communities, I can think of many, but two in particular communities in the United States that have been really deeply oppressed by being a part of food production, specifically communities of color. And also we can think of women and their association or feeling of the necessity of being in the kitchen and being those who are cooking um, and having that connection uh, in that process of food. And so I'm wondering how you would suggest that we use our religious traditions to invite them into that food production, but also honor some of the oppression they feel with that association. 
Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't know that there's an answer that goes across all the traditions because each tradition has its own kinds of issues that they have to address. So for instance, in, you know, in the tradition I come from, Christianity, patriarchy is a huge problem, right, for sure. And then we also have to do this difficult work of sort of disentangling the cultural expressions of these faith traditions in their various moments through time, right? So we recognize that in certain periods, certain cultures expressed food production in vastly different ways than we do now. So for instance, in many agricultural communities, it's not that the man rules the house, it's much more that the sense that the husband and wife work together with the whole family to create a local economy in which livelihood production and care are foremost in view. And so the kinds of binaries that we might have and gendered roles, they don't really apply, right? So I think what we have to do is figure out how we can bring questions of justice into the heart of the kinds of places where we're trying to analyze. So you mentioned uh, black communities. I would also add the migrant worker issue, which is a, a tremendous issue. And I think at the root of this is a fundamental disdain for physical labor. Okay, and this is a major, major problem. And so when I think about how we can use our faith traditions or religious traditions to, to recover a sense of the value and the dignity and the necessity of physical labor, we're not gonna get very far at all. Because right now we're in a situation where nobody wants to do the work because it's hard. And so we're quite happy to use slavery Right? That's been one of the historical answers in agriculture. You can't talk about the history of agriculture without talking about the history of slavery. And because we're nice 21st century people, we don't say that we still employ slavery. But when you look at the conditions of some of our migrant workers, what's the difference? Right? They live in fear, under constant threat of deportation, living in conditions that are clearly life-destroying, body-destroying. And so these are questions that I think we need to use traditions to speak against as they speak against themselves as they try to understand their own systems of injustice that they've created. So Professor Wurzba, you started talking about this and I um, just want to raise this comment because I realized how angry I was listening to your presentations and so I just want to name this because I just spent the last four years being a chaplain to farm workers and I don't know how to have a, a conversation about agriculture and our connections to the land and watersheds and to our active eating without talking about the exploitation that we have on those people. And, um, so I don't have a question, I have a challenge um, that the three of you get to talk about this and so I wanna challenge you to think about the people who you don't talk about, right? That each of you in your presentations got so close to mentioning farm workers by name and didn't do that. And so I just wanna offer that challenge to you, um, acknowledging that I learned a lot from your presentations and also that the people that I got to serve for four years were ignored by your presentations. Um, and, and, and I also wanna say that, like, that I learned so much and I'm so grateful that, that Norman, that, that you started to talk about that too. So thank you. I'm, I'm puzzled, I don't know how I did not talk about farm work. I mean, I stressed that this is the job that needs to be done. Um, so I really don't know how to respond, I mean, you have to understand that historically, farmers have always been the despised group in the world. Always. I think this is you're not making a new thing. So you're making a distinction between farmers who own their farms and farm workers who who only work on them, right? And that we didn't address farm workers as distinct from farmers. Is that right? I wish. Yes. Yes. Okay. I think they just did. Though. They were responding to it. But it's a, it's a wonderful intervention. Excuse me, I, I just gave the mic to that gentleman, sure. if you don't mind. Uh, thank you all so much for your presentations. Um, hopefully, uh, in my question, I'll maybe address the other sort of proverbial elephant in the room, um, and that is the question of economics. That, um, and I, I say this as a person who's spent a good amount of time on organic um, farming operations. I'm, I think this issue goes beyond desire, right? The folks who are doing these sort of monocropping um, industrial agriculture farming, um, they don't want to do it per se. Uh, they are, in a way, slaves to that system. 
uh, thinking specifically about the subsidization of corn and soy, for example. Um, so how can we talk about this in a way that addresses those macroeconomic issues um, as a way that um, doesn't simply uh, stick to the reimagination of food or the moralization of, of eating, but also addresses the system that's uh, contributed to it? Because we're running out of time, uh, we'll take one more question and then answer the two questions together. One last question, yes. I'd like to know how you put together the incredibly hard work of the farm and uh, the need for help, particularly at harvest time. You have to have help. And your, question, your, your suggestion that there might be new methods or new ways of addressing this, I'd like to know what they are. Do you want to go with that? <laughs> okay. So I, I just alluded to local food economies, okay? This is absolutely crucial, not just because it's a way, and this is also getting to your question, it's not a way of simply trying to get away from a system that we don't find pleasing, but to mount a direct challenge to a system that we know is so destructive of all the bodies of the world. And this is going to require a major cultural shift. Okay, because if we understand how to do something like regenerative or natural systems agriculture, we're talking physical labor, right? Which is exactly what we don't want to do. So that's going to be a major shift, and that's why we need traditions who can affirm the dignity of agricultural work. And then we're going to have to start talking about very different kinds of social structures, economic forms. We may be talking local currencies. I mean, there are so many dimensions here because the kind of centralized, consolidated industrial food system that we have today, right, is all premised on the idea of convenience, right? We want life on the cheap. And this is exactly what we need our traditions to tell us is that life is not cheap. And so for us to consume the life and the death of the world, we have to put our pos ourselves in positions of a kind of self-offering to the world. And that's going to mean the cultivation, not just of lands that we need to do, but the cultivations of the communities and the culture that are going to inspire folks to want to do this work, right? We should think here about how the early use of the term culture referred simply to a piece of land. And then more broadly, the skills that human beings need to take care of the land. And within the space of about 200 years, that gets flipped entirely so that a cultured person is precisely the one who has no soil under their finger hands, under their fingernails, mm -hmm. and no smell of shit on them. Okay? This is the exact opposite of how this word culture figured in the earliest usage. So how do we help our, our fellow human beings uh, see a culture in which care of the land and the plants and the animals uh, can be a foremost priority. That's going to require a massive cultural shift. But look, this is what we're talking about here. We're not talking about little tweaks here and there. Yeah, just, to, just to add to that, and I think to address some of your question, I spent a number of years at Iowa State University and, and talking with farmers who were trapped by that system. And for a number of farmers, there are plenty of farmers who would like to shift over to alternate systems, but they are trapped in a, a world in which they can't get the loans to, I mean, they can only get loans if they buy the Monsanto technological package, so that so they are trapped. So I think, I mean, this is, I don't know how to answer any of this, but we are in a system, or we are in a situation where it's, it's not just, I see that, where it's not just going to be a cultural, it's going to be a larger economic, it's going to be a massive economic transformation. I'm not an economist, I don't know how we do that, but it, it requires a much bigger shift than simply thinking, you know, I want to love my carrot and I'm going to grow it and, ten, you know, care for it. We're talking massive social changes and ideally we do that under a, a nice transformation, not a revolution because I don't think revolutions do anyone any good, but um, it, it does require a lot, a, a massive change. I just want to acknowledge what you said. You're absolutely right. I just know how we do it. Yeah. I, would, I would also call attention to Whitney's forthcoming book on intentional community uh, and the idea of intentional community as, as one of these alternative economic structures, a really good model of farmers who are are using community to address this would be the um, the landless workers movement in Brazil, uh, which uses a provision in the Brazilian constitution that allows them to um, take possession of large agricultural estates that um, aren't being used, uh, and they've really created 
uh, some good models uh, for farming sustainably in community. Uh, lots of the folks that both Whitney and I study are doing parallel things uh, in the global north where they could be, I think, interacting more deeply with farm worker movements here. So uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. So please join me in thanking our speaker. <laughs>So we, don't, we want to mention the Union of Concerned Scientists has a huge effort on food issues across the board, working with Mark Pittman okay? and so on. Food Inc., Eric Schlosser, there's a lot of very, very important things coming out, but really what they're pulling us together is into this discussion. And now we have another big one as well, climate change. So let's make that transition, okay? Thank you.